say, hey, loves, okay? I want y'all to understand. Um, a saying that I say is, you are seen, you are heard, you are loved, and despite your imperfections, you are perfectly you, okay? And so whenever I say, hey, loves, because somebody probably didn't tell you that they love you today, but guess what? You were wonderfully made into who you are, right? And because of that, you're loved. So when I say, hey, loves, y'all say, hey, loves back, okay? So, hey, loves. Hey, loves. Okay, there we go. So um, my radio broadcasting sister, Legina Ray, uh, she's amazing. Yes, we both have rays. We are rays of sunshine. So I just want to first thank Melanie Mines for having all of us. Um, thanks for that amazing introduction. Yes, I did uh, write that. Um, just real quick, I have this thing called the great perspective. Okay, everybody has their own perspective, right? Right? So I have this thing called the great perspective. Okay? And yes, I'm a stage three breast cancer survivor. Okay? And so, again, really big thing as far as with our mental health, we, a lot of people stay in that victimhood, right? And so my panel is phenomenal because we have took a lot of our things as far as victimhood and became victorious in it. We have been able to take a lot of our traumas and be able to turn them into triumphs. We have been able to, to assess within ourselves, like mental health is real. So I am so honored to have these amazing, uh, my amazing panel. They look so good, don't they? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves, but they all live a great perspective, and uh, that is my signature process. Get your goals, release your scars, evolve your mindset, arrange your dailies, and transform your perspective. And so, panelists, I'm going to let y'all go one by one, and you just introduce your name and what you do, and tell them a fun fact about yourself. Just a fun fact, just something goofy, okay? Because we that's what that's our business, okay? So Hello, good afternoon. My name is Shanti Refuge. I am a certified mental health coach and life coach. I also have a series of guided journals that help you to help yourself heal. I teach people how to journal and to set goals that are attainable and I push you forward so that you can attain those goals realistically and with love. Fun fact about me. I'm fun. I have a lot of fun facts. <laughs> you are fun. I like to people watch. Ooh, that's so fun. It is. Be like, you know, I don't like coming to this dinner with you. I know. That's why I'm on my phone the whole time. <laughs> yeah, that, that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be on this panel with all these wonderful people here today. Um, I'm Elisa Beagle, I'm owner of Beyond Living Wellness. Um, I'm a psychotherapist, and um, I help people with the goal achievement and dream realization, and just you know helping people navigate through life circumstances. Oh, yeah, fun fact. That, come uh, on, that's right. Yeah, somebody got me. Yeah, fun fact. Too. Um, fun fact. Just something random. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, um, fun fact, right. the main thing I can think about right now is mm, I played professional basketball one hey. time in my life. Nice. Nice. Hey everyone, good afternoon. My name is Akil Bernard, certified professional coach, and uh, my narrowed niche is occupational wellness, so I help people to fall back into love with work. I help people to advocate for themselves at work. And then long-term goals is implementing more channels for mental wealth, uh, mental wellness, mental health. There's the general conversation in the corporate space. Um, so that's uh, what I hold space for. Fun fact, I am born and raised on the beautiful island of Trinidad and Tobago. So I love all oh, things carnival. So um, if oh, there's I a carnival happening somewhere on the globe, my goal is to be there and um, just to enjoy the sun and all the fun things that come with you know being Caribbean. So there's the Caribbean people in here, link up in the back, okay? Right. I ain't Caribbean, but I show like to dance, like um. Hey y'all, hey. Hey. 
My name is Jakia Brew. I'm the CEO and founder of Gully Thoughts LLC, a mental health awareness company. I also created this wonderful workbook. It's a six week program to help you really blossom into yourself, has challenges and activities to really tap into your trauma, release yeah. that trauma. Oh no. And then uh, I'll get it later. <laughs> and manifest your dream life. And I'm also a poet. So if y'all love poetry, come see me in the city. Oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate you, King. Um, and my fun fact is I wear my color like a mood ring, so next week will probably be green or blue or whatever, hey. so don't judge me when y'all see me. I hey, love it's like it. that. Y'all give a hand clap for my panelists. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, first off, do y'all see that we have a black man on the stage? <laughs> so I was like, you know I'm gonna be asking some questions. <laughs> I had the mic at the right time, see that? <laughs> <laughs> So, Akil, um, there, we're in the black and brown community, right? And a lot of times, you know, a lot of men, they don't really talk about their mental health, their feelings, their emotions. Um, as a black woman, how can we support you? Um, how can we show up for you? That's a lot layered question, right? Um, so a little bit about myself and my, my journey into mental health. Um, the only reason that I'm doing the work that I'm doing right now and I've you know started doing my internal work, my shadow work, all that good stuff is I had hit rock, rock bottom. I lost my youngest brother. He was, at the time that he passed, 14. And prior to that, you hear things about mental health and all this stuff, but for me, my journey towards healing came from loss. And from hitting that rock bottom, I, my relationship with food, drinking too much, smoking, all of those things were coping mechanisms. And then I found an amazing partner right when I had started my journey. And she talked me into going to therapy. She talked me into just being OK with being not OK. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, black women hold space. You all are naturally nurturing people, all right? All you guys are nurturers from the time you enter the world. And a lot of the times, black men just need to see other black men doing the work. So while you're holding safety for us to actually go do that work, for us, oftentimes, it needs to be familiarity. We need to see other men. We need to talk to other men. And from black women, it's just a matter of pushing us to go into those spaces. Um, because we're not going to simply just go do the work. We need to hear and see other people that look like us doing the work in order for us to start on that journey. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, y'all can snap. Come on. I like snaps. We'll do that. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, y'all can just keep passing because I'm going to get in there. Uh, so one thing that I've realized is um, within our community, uh, there are also, you know, like there's minorities as far as like within the LGBTQ community, right? And mental health is real even in that community. And so um, this can be for, because I have that community up here, but what are some ways that people can be supportive as far as within that community and mental health? Like tying them together, who would like to go? Um, I think how you started it, everybody wants to feel loved, everybody wants to feel seen, and everybody wants to feel heard. You know what I mean? Whether, whatever gender you're attracted to, everybody, that's a necessity. So just the community allowing those spaces for the LGBTQ plus community to feel seen, feel heard. Um, Legina said something yesterday that just because you, ex you can accept something that you don't understand. Right. So just because you don't understand them doesn't mean you can't accept them as a human being that deserves those necessities. So, you know, programs that are in the city that are specifically for us to thrive, to love, to be, to succeed, that's just needed because we're human, you right. know? And the mental health and our mental and our, um, our strength lies in feeling like we're somebody in the community. And that's why depression and suicide rates are so high in our community because Agreed. we don't feel accepted. So if we don't feel accepted, how do we feel like we have a purpose? How do we feel like we belong? If we don't feel like we belong, then we're gonna stay in the closet. We're gonna stay in our homes and we're not gonna speak out loud and we don't have to wave this rainbow flag. Right. You know what I'm saying? But the reason why I 
am so um, passionate about it is because I did have a suicide attempt. I was in a mental hospital for three weeks because I didn't feel like I had a space in the world. I didn't feel like I belonged. You know, growing up in a religious space, the church teaches you that you're wrong. Right. You know, and that's a real thing that in religion and in church we say pray it away, do this, do that. But what, why aren't we talking to these young kids and, and teaching them about their power? Right. about their strength, about their, their personality, about their greatness. We're just so focused on who you're attracted to right. and who you want to be with, but they're more than that. We're more than our attraction. So, Love that. That's good. Um, I'm going to piggyback off of what Kia said. That's she did a really great job of explaining, but basically some of the things that she said is that we're all human. That's the race. We're all right. human, right? So we all need love. We all need support. We all need care. And instead of us focusing on our differences, sometimes we need to focus on the similarities. You know, maybe you've never faced uh, extreme depression, but you felt sad. You know, you've been sad at some point. You know, you've had maybe have a loss. You know, maybe you haven't had somebody die, but you've experienced a loss of a relationship, a loss of a friend, a loss of whatever. So I think if we could just focus on what are the similarities more than what are the differences, I think it would be a lot easier. It's like t treat everybody like a human being, yeah. right? Treat everybody kindly, treat everybody nice. You never know what anybody is going through and you never know when you're going to need that same treatment. So I think it's really important to just to focus on those similarities, focus on thinking of this person like that could be your sister, that could be your brother, that could be your mom, that could be your dad, that could be your uncle, you know, whoever, and really just making sure that you give the kind of love, care, and support that you would need. Yes. Come on. All right. So one thing that I have learned as being a person that has dealt, I am considered a highly functioning person with anxiety, highly functioning person with depression, and also a suicide survivor. I have had multiple attempts. Cause you know, life be lifing, okay? Um, but guess what? God be guarding for me. <laughs> I like that. So, <laughs> so being that I realize that I am a walking miracle, um, going through stage three breast cancer, uh, being diagnosed at 31, one thing that I realized is um, a matter of my day-to-day -day routine. And so with, with knowing my day-to-day -day routine, I had to really hone in on self-care practices. And so um, y'all have some amazing self-care things that y'all do. Uh, Shanti, you do journaling, and I don't like journaling because I don't like writing, okay? But how can somebody that's like, you know, I don't want to go back to where I was. I, I, I want to stand in the light of, of being and really walking in my light and, and really honing in on the things within myself. Journaling has been very beneficial to you. Can you teach us, like, what are some ways that can help us in journaling? First, um, when you journal, even if you start to think about journaling, you have to commit to being honest with yourself. We lie to ourselves so much that we start to believe our own lies. Mm -hmm. And journaling will make you tell the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say what you want in this journal, but you know, after a while you're gonna be like, okay, this is not me. And journaling the way I had to learn how to do it wasn't a good way. Um, back in 2018, I had a mental breakdown where I just woke up and went berserk and I couldn't control it. And I didn't like that. And I did not want to be put on drugs. So, you know, my wonderful therapist, Camila, taught me how to journal. And uh, from that, I learned that, you know, I had to accept myself for who I was. Because most of my life I was pretending that I was straight, pretending that I was gonna do this because somebody else wanted me to do it. I, want, I got married because somebody else wanted me to do it. And it had to come to a point, and I'm glad I had my nervous breakdown, because if I didn't, I'd probably still be married with a million kids. And, Cause I know that's not what I wanted. So journaling helped me to actually be honest with myself and say, okay, Shanta, yes, you're a lesbian. Yes, Shanta, you're this. You know, you were made for more. You're not just somebody who sits and take dictation. And you know, not, not that anything's wrong with it, but I know that's not who I was. Right. So I had to stand in my truth, and journaling helped me to do that. And so now, you know, I am, how many, 18, 19, 21, 22, four, five, almost five years, I'm fine. Because I know where to turn to when I have my bad days. 
you know, we think we can go talk to our mom, dad, sister, brother, cousin, uncle, best friend, they're gonna listen, but they're not gonna understand. Right. You know, all they can, oh baby, I'm sorry that happened to you, blah, 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 but you know, we need more than that. And when you journal and get intimate with yourself, get vulnerable with yourself, and actually see those words on that paper, and then you see your progress when you are consistent with it, you can yeah. go back and be like, dang, that was me? That don't sound like me, because this is not who I am right now. Right. So journaling actually works. Yes. 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 And then I'll Can I piggyback off of that real quick, I right? So a lot of people think journaling is just the writing portion, which I think is great. I, I personally love that, you know, pen and paper, right? But I think also it's also finding different forms of release that fits you, right? Yes. So for me, Agreed. journaling some days, you know, getting my Moesha on, like, you know, writing a little <laughs> journal, you know, um, is, is great. But then there's some days I'm on the move a lot. So right. I just pull out, you know, my phone and I press play on my voice memo and I talk into my uh, to my phone, and it's really good because I can talk as much as I want. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm in traffic. I'm right. I'm getting a release for that day, right? And for me, also seeing the words is very important. So you know, there's an app for everything now. I have a transcription app where it transcribes my whole voice memo yeah. into words, and when I read it, and I'm like, wow, like, okay, this is a lot. It just is a different feeling. Um, and then for some people, to me, video journaling is also is also really important. That's like exactly she was saying, was like saying. you can see where you were. Like sometimes your face looks different from where you were at that time. Mm -hmm. Like when you were in a depression or where you were very anxious, like you can tell like how fast you were talking or how you looked or were there bags on your eyes when you weren't getting enough sleep because you were dealing with a whole bunch of anxious thoughts as you know, and you weren't getting enough rest. So I think like just also expanding, you know, your definitions of these words, you know, or like she says, she has a self-help book where you can write and uh, you know, do different types of things so you can write um, and it has more guided writing so using really good journaling tools too Amazon has a bunch of them um, you hold know up, and hold up hold up Hold up. And Pause. she had, she has, she, Shanti got, Shanti got, Shanti got, Shanti got, Shanti got Amazon. 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 Kia got some. I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize. I apologize. Shanti journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the only two that Follow exist right on now. Instagram. <laughs> all right, I do apologize. Amazon but, um, ain't getting all my money. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, right. but yeah, but yeah, like mm -hmm. you get the gist of what I'm saying, y'all. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do apologize about that. But yeah, Look, but it, it, at right. the end of the day, it's about just seeing what fits you too in those right. spaces. Right. Agreed. <laughs> um, and you know what? I'm going to tell y'all uh, how a form of my journaling, because my therapist, my all of them, even my psychiatrist, they were like, hey, you know, you need to start journaling. I, I don't do that right and stuff. Because in, in the middle of like, I don't know, a lot of y'all have pursued, you know, education and stuff like that. And I went all the way to a doctor's and it just got to the point for me, I had to write a whole dissertation. So I said, no, I don't want to get to the point of having to write. So guess what? My form of journaling has been motivational content creating. And so when people follow me on Instagram, I, that's me. Like me having my time, getting my vitamin D, cause they said I gotta do that, okay? So you know, it's like, let me do my little mental health stuff, okay? Gotta go outside, let me go outside. Gotta go outside, gotta do affirmations. All right, let me do an affirmation for me and then put it out, you know? Let me, um, speak truth into myself, and then be able to help others with it. So, you know, if you find your way of journaling, just know that sometimes you can, through your healing, you can heal others. You know, I hear a lot of people say, hurt people hurt people, but heal people can heal people. All right, we, it's getting deep, but guess what? I'm this goofy, okay? So I'm like, y'all, let's tell me in y'all's mental health, as far as in y'all's life, y'all have had to, um, we all like superheroes, right? Yeah. Right? And so you have had to more than likely be a superhero. And so I just want y'all to like go down and just say like, what superhero do you think you had to be like when you transform like your traumas and became into in your triumphs? So I'll start it off because I don't want y'all steal mine, okay? <laughs> I have been and will always be Wonder Woman. No, that's me. No, baby. I, I had to tell my students, no, baby, I am Wonder Woman, okay? I first, after going through suicide, 
I was like, oh, I guess I'm becoming Wonder Woman. But after going through breast cancer and seven surgeries and having both of my breasts chopped off, I mean, I'm like, baby, <laughs> don't come for me, <laughs> okay? I am Wonder Woman. So that's my character. What, what's y'all's characters? Wonder Woman. You could be Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Okay. Because I... It took me a long time to admit something was wrong. I knew something was wrong, but you know, you know that commercial that you see with the lady holding up the smiley face, but mm. behind that smiley face she looking like that, that was me, literally. I was going to work, doing day to day, pretending until I couldn't pretend anymore. So I had to be Shanti the employee, Shanti the mother, Shanti the wife, mm. Shanti the daughter, Shanti whoever everybody else wanted me to be. And you know, now that I have come onto the other side, I'm still Superwoman because I know. Are you Superwoman or Wonder Woman? Both of them. Okay. I got an alter ego. You could be Both. two. You could, I have alter ego. They got ego, a lot of so people living inside fine. of me. It's fine. And it's like now I take what I have learned and what I've been through, and I help other people, so that they can, you know, get past and get over and get through with theirs, so they can help other people. So yeah, I'm all out. And is above. All right, I love it. Um, I'm gonna come back to this one. I think of a good character, and y'all already took Wonder Woman, Superwoman, so yeah. Uh -huh. I'm good. Look, on Cause it. I got some more. Uh, for me, um, I don't think this superhero exists, so I get to create one on the spot, right? Um, so my superpower would be taking in energy and then making it positive and sending it back out. Oh, um, I like that. So I don't know what I don't know what I would call myself, but if y'all got a name, let me know. We'll coin it. We'll think um, of one. And the reason I picked that is because in this part of my spiritual ev ev evolution, I, I really do believe that my purpose here is to listen actively yeah. and take that in and then amplify what goes out. Yeah. Um, and especially for my brothers out there, because rarely do you see somebody else doing the work in real time that comes from my background, working in corporate and then making the transition to come do healing work. Um, looking to hold space to, to become trained in doula hood so I can bring my children into the, into the world and be part of that. Uh, so I'm tapping into my nurturing energy, which oftentimes is identified as feminine energy, but I'm comfortable there. I'm comfortable being the only man on a panel full of women. I'm comfortable yes. being the only man in a room full of black, strong women Come on. and being able to listen and then also being able to represent us in rooms where we're often not represented. I love it. I love that. Uh, my superhero is Black Panther. Ooh. I feel like he had a lot of doubt. He had to, you know, really think like, can I fill my father's shoes? Are these shoes too big for me to fill? And I really struggled with self-doubt my whole life. And I really got to the point where, you know, I started stepping into my purpose and started stepping into my passion. I feel like your purpose is your best antidepressant. Yeah. And uh, once you start walking into that passion, you start seeing yourself different. You start acting different. Your behaviors start to change. Right. And then you start to show other people that they could do the same thing. So seeing, you know, Black Panther on the screen, a lot of little kids are like, oh, my gosh, it's a superhero, but he's black. Yeah. And I could be that. So yes. that's, it represents me, I feel. Love it. Wakanda forever. <laughs> Wakanda forever. You got one? Yeah, I just got a superpower. I'm gonna be like a kill. I don't really have a name for it. Hey, that's you cool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's yeah, right. right. Like, we'll cool. find we'll find a name later. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but I think um, you know this might seem seem cliche, but I think being a safe space. Um, I think um, I have the ability to find a point of relatability for everyone I speak to. Like I said earlier, it's kind of like we're all human. There's a point of relatability, right, with everyone that I meet. And I think just making people feel like they can feel heard, felt, and understood. I feel like if we're human, we all want that or desire that at some point. And I think just being a safe space, just listening. Um, a lot of people think it's because I'm a therapist. No, like I was this person before I was a therapist. Right. I just happened to feel like, oh, they have a job where they're gonna pay me to do it? Right. Oh, all right, I was already doing already it for free. It. <laughs> you know, I do this for free, but I mean, if y'all wanna, you know, give it a profession and a name, I'm cool with it, you know? But I think that's very, very important for me is to make sure, you know, everybody um, feels like they have a space, right? And they don't feel alone, you know? Even if they have a thousand people around them, people can still feel like they are alone and have no one. And I think it's very important if I show up in anybody's life in any space that they feel like they had a chance to actually feel that, that, that safe space to feel heard, felt, and understood. 
So. Yes. So um, one thing that um, I realized uh, being probably the first in my family to be diagnosed, uh, I felt like I was the crazy one. I felt like I was the weird one. I felt like I was the one that was out of the box. And, you know, for the longest, it used to be a, that's a Whitney Ray problem. You know, that's something that she's dealing with. And um, it was hard. It was really hard because it felt, um, I felt lonely. And um, I felt like I was the only one, weird one, but it was weird. Do y'all remember having those family members that were just a little bit off, right? As far as like, just, you know, things that they said, things that they did, why uncle so-and-so can't come to the family picnic, okay? And you know, all these different things, but a lot of people weren't diagnosed, right? And so being that I'm now a, di um, a generation that has been diagnosed, I can proudly say, because I've been diagnosed and seek the help as far as in therapy um, and practicing daily as far as like self-care routines and being on my medicine, y'all, that's my happy pill. Um, that has helped me to be a better example. And not only am I not the crazy person, but I'm the most level-headed one in the family. And my family has been able to get, pretty much all my immediate family has been able to get into therapy. So leading to that, as a therapist, like how are ways that we can communicate, because I was not the best communicator whenever I got diagnosed and was on my meds, because I was mad. I was mad because I felt like I was the only one. Um, one, I feel like also, and, and you as a therapist, sometimes um, we get, we as black people get diagnosed with these extreme cases. Like, I, like it was borderline, they were like, um, you might be bipolar. And I feel like we as, as black individuals deal with PTSD on a larger scale. So if I'm getting diagnosed by a psychiatrist, who is white, okay, and I'm just gonna be real, that does not understand my day-to-day -day as a black woman, they might think, oh, that's extreme, but that might be my normal. That might be my normal. So um, have you seen it that people have been misdiagnosed, um, been able, and, and, and like also like what are ways that we can advocate for ourselves and communicate better with psychiatrists, therapists, to be able to, to do better. Like how we need to, cause I, yeah. People have been misdiagnosed because of this. So it more so about advocacy and kind of. My, it's kind of a multiple question. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> look, that's my ADHD, okay, y'all. Um, so is how can we communicate better to therapists as far as to ensure that we don't get misdiagnosed? And then also, as far as how can we advocate more like, this is something within my community. Do we need to just go to a black psychiatrist? Do we need to just go to a, you know, a black therapist? Like, what do you think? So one of the things I think first is like really kind of, if you don't have a great understanding of what you're going through, just kind of writing, like talked about the journaling, um, having ways where you just write things down, some of your daily things that you're going through or what you're struggling with. Um, another thing is being as open as possible. I know it's hard for the concept that you're just going to sit and talk to a stranger and tell them all your business. Um, but we are, y'all are protected by HIPAA, like, you know, by law, like we cannot <laughs> go and spread your business anywhere, right? So you're protected by law, so understand that is the thing, right? Um, and also understand that um, to be able to get through things being as open as possible is the best way, and that's the way that we can understand the most to be able to help you, right? So if you're as open as possible, even if you don't know any of the you know, jargon or whatever, you can just talk about what you've been through, what you've been navigating, and, you know, we can do our best to help you and help you navigate and also be able to, you know, seek help in the best way. Like, I, I'm 
you know, um, if you're considering like going to a therapist or going to a coach, like the best thing I would suggest is just having a consultation. If you're having, you know, anxiety about it, don't know how it's going to be, having a consultation and just really laying it on the floor. And then there's a, pl a plenty, plenty and plenty of resources to be able to help you navigate and get to your best self. Um, but the key is also really um, starting to do things for yourself and understand things like understand like okay is there a certain place that i go that i start to feel like my heart race i start to feel my palms are sweaty okay yeah you're probably dealing with anxiety but you may not even recognize an anxiety or if you're irritable that could be also a form of anxiety right because you're maybe looking for everything to go perfect or go well right um and so like really going into consultations with some kind of you know record of what you've been going through um, can be really helpful in people helping you help yourself. Yeah. Awesome. Can I add, add that? Yeah. I'm, I'm not a therapist, but I, I can kind of relate to the being diagnosed. I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder uh, in 2017, but I just want to give hope to anybody that you're not a label. Um, although right. they diagnose you, although they give you this name that maybe relates to your behaviors or relates to what you're going through, uh, sometimes we can get attached to that label. And sometimes yes. our worth can diminish because they give us a label because we don't feel as important in society because now we have a mental illness. But I want to let anybody know that if you have been diagnosed or you will be diagnosed in the future, you still can achieve what you want to achieve. You still can be who you want to be. So don't let that diminish your worth. Yeah. If I can um, add on to that too, one of the things that I've experienced in, in more recent times is folks actually can also experience situational depression that doesn't yes. necessarily require a diagnosis. If you feel like it's tough for you to get out of bed in the morning, but you don't really understand the root of it, it might just be attached to a certain situation that's happening. And people oftentimes, they jump to the total opposite end of you know, the, the spectrum, right? Like, oh, you're either emotionally unintelligent or, you know, you, are, you need a diagnosis. Sometimes you're in the middle and you just need to take time and to talk to somebody, to have somebody to listen to you. So I like to advocate for situational depression as well because that's something that I dealt with. I've never been diagnosed, but like when you lose people or you lose things that are near and dear to your heart, that can cause you to fall into an emotional situation where you feel depleted. Yeah. And we oftentimes don't get to talk about that and hold space to have that conversation. I'm not a therapist, but I want to speak from a client perspective. It is hard enough for us as black people or people of color to even decide to go talk to a stranger and tell them all our business. So know that you have a choice and you have a voice and who is helping you. And it's rare that you're gonna find your person on the first meet. Yeah. Yeah. My recommendation, find someone who looks like you, comes from where you come from. Can I, and you will know this on the first meet. Consultation, you'll know, you'll feel it. Trust your gut, use discernment. It took me four therapists to find my therapist. So, and then that was a process. And, and you can get discouraged by, oh, I don't want to repeat this all over again to another person. Do it, yeah. because it's for you. You are helping yourself. So, you know, don't get tired. Don't get, oh, forget it. You know, and, you know, I'll just deal with it because it's going to come back and bite your bed. Right. So you advocate for yourself. You know, don't let someone tell you. You tell them. And if they, you feel like that person isn't listening to you, move around. Okay. They yes. work for you. Right. Not the other way around. Agreed. So you have a choice. Yes. Good job. Y'all can give a hand clap for that. <laughs> so one thing that I noticed is, um, you know, uh, whenever I started therapy, you know, we definitely had to go through the process of digging deep and talking about everything. And a lot of people don't talk about that. Um, my good sis is in here. and. We talk about because we both in therapy and nobody talks about how hard it is to like release those scars. Um, how we have to relive memories that we don't want to. And uh, it, it can be a lot to deal with. And so um, a lot of people think, oh, I'm supposed to go to therapy and then I, everything's supposed to be like good and gravy, right? But that's not the case. Um, and thank God for my supportive system that 
we be talking like, girl, guess she tried me today, okay? <laughs> this therapist gonna challenge me to do this. But what are ways that like, like just pushing through, persevering in therapy because it is some tough stuff that we have to release. We have to release those scars. And then from that, we have to find the root of the problem and be able to evolve from that. So what are ways that you can still persevere in that? I know this is therapist. <laughs> <laughs> so therapy is difficult, okay? I'm in therapy myself. I'm a therapist who's in therapy. And your therapist and, should be yeah, in yeah, therapy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, so. I feel like, you know, there is going to be moments where you hit blocks or you are triggered, right? Um, and that's because that's that's part of the process, right? That's part of the healing process. Um, so some of the ways that I would suggest going about that is, is one, being vocal about that. I mean, like, I feel triggered right now. I'm hitting a block. This is a lot, right? Um, and you know, a good therapist is going to be able to offer suggestions and help you through that, right? Um, funny story is like, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been ghosted in a dating relationship era, but I have been ghosted by a client, right? A couple of clients. I and that is a therapist. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that is because I realized they've, they've hit their block. Um, even though I would like to help them, I also understand the process can be tough sometimes. It is okay to take a moment um, away from therapy, and, but still doing the work outside of that, right? Because um, it, it can get challenging, right? Um, and, and that is okay. I think, you know, I suggest communicating that and still having things that you do, like being in wellness circles, you know, having an activity that you look forward to, maybe yoga, maybe working out. Mental um, health having conferences. A, yeah, your mental health conferences, um, finding alternative forms of wellness, even trying a coach, right? If you're like, hey, like, I'm, I've been in therapy, I'm working through trauma, let me work on, you know, work with the coach and see how that goes as well. But just continuing to evolve is the key, right? Um, and just having safe spaces where you can do that and continue on your journey. Awesome. I think, um, too, uh, what she said, her support group, uh, I think God didn't create us to heal alone. Um, I don't believe we're supposed to go through this life alone. So when you're diving into your trauma, you're facing those scars, you're looking at those demons, you're trying to heal from all these, you know, things that happen in your life, you have to have a support group. You have to have people that are thinking like you, that are healing like you, that are growing like you, because it's hard to do this alone. So, you know, if you need a resource, I have a weekly accountability group where we go through the journal and the workbook yes. together. Because sometimes when you're just in your room and you're writing down your trauma, you're triggered, now you're sitting in your room triggered, now you're crying and now you put the workbook away and you go on about life and you just suppress all that that you're supposed to be working on instead of going through it as a group we're talking together we're releasing together we're laughing together and things like this like they said the mental health conference to be around other people that you know are healing or working towards that is inspiring yeah. because yeah it, this shit is hard yes yeah. agreed so much gems just now and i i, I just really want to jump in and add that sometimes getting the therapy is a journey and you need to hear from other people how therapy has changed their lives, right? In order yes. for you to believe it, you need to see it. And then one of those avenues that a lot of people can actually seek out is peer support groups. Um, so I'm a certified peer support specialist in the state of California and then also in Texas. And then what I've seen in those spaces are you have so many people that feel more comfortable talking to a peer instead of speaking to somebody that in those situations are considered kind of like an authority figure. Because when you go and you're paying to talk to a therapist, they are the subject matter expert. When you're talking to a client, uh, when you're talking to a coach, we can also be considered a subject matter expert. But when you're talking to a room full of your peers and they're talking about their challenges, things that they've gone through, how they hit rock bottom and how they made it back to the top, or even simply like their, their struggles with drugs and how it led to mental health challenges, you see yourself reflected in the room and then you're more likely to go to therapy and that's especially for men as well. We tend to, to go in directions where we see ourselves reflected. So the more spaces that we have where we can meet men where they're at, to talk to them about the, the transformation of therapy, the easier it is for us to acknowledge that and embrace that we might need to go to therapy to talk to somebody to get the help that we need. Awesome, awesome. 
Okay, guys, y'all know it's goofy moment time. All right, so um, I don't know about y'all, but there's things that I've had to implement in my life to be able to get out of my head and just live life, okay? One for me, and y'all just tell me what's that one thing that you've had to do to get out of your head and be able to just keep it moving because we want to help them. Me, it's dancing, okay? So I love to dance. I, I like to boogie on down. <laughs> Damn, Doogie, okay, you know what I'm <laughs> Look, I ain't gonna go all the way down, but you know what I'm saying. So I like to dance, and I have come to the mindset of just like, that just releases so much. The endorphins, you know, just makes me happy. I call, sometimes I call my girlfriends and I'm like, let's go out and dance. Now, I do it when I'm in uh, extrovert mode, and then whenever I flip into introvert mode, I'm like, is that nine? We gonna, I can't do that. Oh, I gotta take a nap. So what is that thing for y'all that helps y'all get out of your head? Well, you took mine. Mine's definitely dancing too. But well, we can dance, come yeah, on, hey! Okay, but um, my second one is definitely poetry. I think any form of self-expression, it, it just moves that energy around. You just you get it out of you when you're on stage. You just can say whatever the hell you wanna say right. and can't nobody say nothing about it. You know what I mean? So. It just gets me to another space and to another dimension. So I just encourage anybody to find their form of self-expression, whatever that is for you. Awesome. Yeah, I'll double down on that and say movement, not just dance. Um, I find myself when I'm in my meditative state, I'm listening to drums and my body takes on a natural flow of movement. Um, and being from the Caribbean and have, you know, everyone in here is, you know, bop, bop, bop. from Africa, you know what I mean? <laughs> I feel a strong connection to music and it just, it's a part of me, you know what I mean? I love drums, I love water, I love most things that yeah. allow me to move freely and, and doesn't restrict me in my movement. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think for me, mine would be uh, just sports. I don't have to be good at it, okay? Uh, I'm Serena Williams in my business. head, okay? I'm Serena Williams in my head, but I suck at tennis, so don't challenge me. But, <laughs> um, but just Let's any form, any form of like sports or just some type of movement. I like going to play basketball. It's my first love, so I like you know talking smack. Like, oh, you gonna guard me or what? Like, you know, and it's just fun. It's just funny to me because it's you know it's not the WNBA. I'm I'm just playing and I'm gonna go home and it's gonna you know, go about my business. Um, so just, you know, being outside, you know, playing. I like badminton, just like different types of sports. I like trying things um, and new experiences, so yeah. Awesome. Um, my thing is um, meditation with drums and singing bowls. Ooh. I love that. That is so calming and doing breath work. And, you know, sometimes you be so into it that tear. You open your eyes and next thing you know you're crying. I had to st start stop wearing lashes when I go because my lashes will be over here oh. after. Because I I don't go in there with the intention of crying. You know I go you know breathing and all that stuff and the lashes over here. So I had to quit wearing them. But that that is my you know release. So there's a lot of things you can do. You just have to find what works for you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, um, now I'm going to ask some Kia. You, you ready for a question? I'm ready, baby. All right, so in what ways can uh, technology and digital platforms be harnessed uh, to improve mental health services and support? And then also, can you talk on the perspective of, you know, we got bullying, you know, digital bullying as mm -hmm. far as with social media is becoming really big <laughs> in, you know, in the world. And so... How do we maintain our mental health and still have to live in this world of social media and, you know? Yeah. Um, I think social media detoxes are very important for our mind. I feel like uh, we weren't meant to consume so much in so little time. So if you're scrolling all day and you're looking at a screen all day, 
I don't know if our brain was really meant to process that. Agreed. So the fact that technology is growing so fast and moving so fast, we have to try to keep up with that. And so doing a social media detox and maybe just taking a day to just not look at it, you know, because then that brings in comparison. And that brings in, now I'm doubting myself. Now that brings in bullying. Now that brings in negative comments. Now that brings in just negativity, period. So also doing inventory on who you follow. You know, I had to yeah. do that a couple years ago where now all I see on my feet is inspirational stuff. Oh, it's yes. my friends, it's yeah. uh, entrepreneurs doing what I want to do. It's, right. it's more inspiration than negativity. And that's important for our mind because um, it's not just nutrition with food. It's everything. Yeah. What we're looking at, what we're listening to, that's nutrition. That's affecting our heart, affecting our soul, affecting our spirit, and also just finding resources out there. Since we love our phone so much, find things on our <laughs> phone like apps yeah. that you know, help us. So I have an app, it's a Hill Boss Up Repeat app, and um, it's just really videos and, and worksheets, and it pairs with the workbook where you can just have healing on the go, you know, yeah. and just have inspiration on the go. So there's ways to use technology for good, but we're in control of that. We have yes. the phone in our hands. Right. We let it control us, though, but yes. we gotta switch that. Yeah. Agree, agree, right. that's good. Okay, Akil, um, I have a question for you. So what are some common misconceptions about mental health that you have encountered and how have you addressed them? That's a really good question. Um, I think the most common misconception that I've run into, especially with the clients that I've worked with, is that I am broken and I don't want to be broken and I'm embarrassed of the thought that I am broken and I need support in order for me to move into a healthier space mentally, physically, and emotionally. And that's something that you hear, especially when you're working in the coaching space, I'm trained to ask really powerful questions, but I'm not a therapist. So I oftentimes have to give a therapeutic refer referral. Um, so I have a lot of you know, therapists in my network and we talk a lot on how can we bridge the gap between what I do as a coach and what you do as a therapist. And there's a lot of common things that we experience is just I'm prone to asking questions and they can actually say, well, this is what's going on and such, but I let the clients lead. So this, con this concept of I am broken is sometimes it just requires you to ask really powerful questions. So like, why do you feel like you're broken? Like, what does broken feel like to you? How does it show up in your body? How does it show up emotionally? And then through those questions, they're able to articulate if they're really broken or if they're not. And I tell them all the time, you're not broken at all. You know what I mean? You're just going through something. You just need to be able to explain it and articulate it first for yourself so that you can actually say, well, I'm not broken. I'm just going through some things and I need support to get to the other end of it. So there's that. And then there's also where I come from in the Caribbean, there's very little conversation around mental health. It's just getting there. But you made a really valid point earlier. Like I have a bunch of family members that had outbursts, that had all of these different things, that right. showed case, showcased signs of uh, bipolar. I can't diagnose that, but now that I've done the work and I understand how it shows up, I can easily say I have people in my family that have not done the work and we have done them a, a, a disservice by not getting them the support that they need. So the goal is go back to places like that where I'm from and start having the conversation. Mm -hmm. Build tables so that people can pull up a seat to have healthy dialogue around what we avoided talking about growing up and how can we change that narrative moving forward. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so as also a coach myself and having clients that I do individual and group um, coaching with, um, one thing that I've learned is I, I take them through this five-week process, The Great Perspective, where they get their goals, release their scars, evolve their mindset, arrange their dailies, and transform their perspective. And with that, I just guide them over the hill. And what I realize is my biggest um, delay, and Akil, I don't know if you've had this, is the partnership and community to partner them with a therapist. I've noticed that a lot of therapists, like I'm like, I have clients for you, and I'm trying to collab with you. Um, I'm trying to get them partner with you. I'm trying to get them in therapy because I already coached them to get to the point that they can feel comfortable being in a therapeutic with the therapist 
um, because a therapist might have them go in detail for getting their goals. And my get your goals is, did you wash your face? Did you brush your teeth? Did you make your bed? Did you put on some clothes? You know, and is that low? And then I'm trying to find the partnership. So my question to you is, what are some ways that we can foster collaboration and partnership between the mental health professionals, uh, community organizations, and um, to help have a cohesive, cohesive mental health system? Like, how, how can we better that? It's really powerful, really powerful question. Um, so I think on just like a, a personal level on me understanding is like having, you know, spaces like this, like Melanin Minds, yeah. like having meetings, making sure that we're getting support as well, you know, cause you know, healers need healing as well. And that's right. how we have our most powerful uh, stories or the way we are able to help people the most is we also are going through our journey and our healing journey and able to, you know, help others. Um, so I think just having like more collaborations and meetings, um, spaces like this, honestly do a lot of good um, advocacy, um, using our uh, personal spaces to, to help, you know, to help direct and help uh, people have better understandings around stigmas and things like that. So I think all those are important spaces to be able to have that, healing circles, um, and just doing our work, and because you never know what opportunity is going to come where you're going to be able to help somebody navigate. Yes, yes. Yeah. great. That was good. Y'all, yeah. that's a therapist. Y'all better clap for that. <laughs> All right, you ready? Okay, so one thing that I've realized is the stigmas of mental health are so real, right? Mm -hmm. And so one thing that um, I've tried to do is, is instead of talk about change needed, I've become the change. Mm -hmm. And um, I do that through my time as far as on, you know, my, my radio broadcasting as far as Crown Chats. Mm -hmm. So what are ways um, on All Real Radio uh, every Friday, <laughs> three to five? Plug. Thank you, have a nice day. Plug, okay. Um, what are ways that you reduce the stigma um, yourself in mental health? I am very transparent about my story. I will tell you in a minute that I went berserk in 2018. I will tell you um, that I went to a psychiatrist who tried to drug me up, and I didn't want that. I can tell you that, you know, oh, I had temporary custody of my niece, and she got taken away. Well, she didn't get taken away. She went back to her mom. And that affected me. That was like grief, and this was just recently. So I'm very transparent with my story. Um, I can tell you that I was a teen mom. I had a kid at 14, and I didn't realize that that was traumatic at the time. And as an adult looking back, it's traumatic. So I, I will share. You, I, I'm an open book. You ask me something, be ready for the answer because you're gonna get it. Right. So, and that's how I am able to, you know, let y'all, hey, you know, I look like a regular person and half the stuff that, I, that okay. are, is about me, you wouldn't know it unless I told you. Right. So I'm going to tell you, so I, w I want you to know you're not by yourself, you're not alone. Yes. Well, that was good. <laughs> um, so you guys, I know that a lot of y'all are probably thinking like, man, I kind of got some questions, I want to ask something. I want to open up the floor for anybody that has any questions. Um, that we, you like to ask our panelists or even myself. Go ahead. Um, I think what you're talking about too is operating in avoidance um, in some ways and knowing the difference between I just need a little time. I think also recognizing like how you exit, right? If it's like I got triggered really bad and I feel like I just need to avoid or take time away 
um, I think, you know, that could be a, a difference to like, okay, how do I exit this space, right? I'm like, now I'm avoiding because I don't want to deal with it. Um, am I actually doing something active to help me in that time? Or am I just like going about my normal activities and not wanting to talk to anybody? I think what am I doing at that alone time um, is very important. Um, I think also, you know, taking time is important for yourself, like to just do like some of the things we talked about, journaling, um, you know, dancing, yeah, wh whatever outside. it is that you need, um, and finding a way to reemerge in society. Because I think, you know, we can only avoid those times. We still have to go to work. We still have to interact with people. Um, but also listening to your body, I think it's really important to understand yourself, right? To spend time with yourself, uh, because. It's hard to speak for everybody. Everybody's different. So I think understanding, like, what are the feelings I'm going through, asking yourself why, doing some writing, doing some things that help you release, and then figuring out how you need to reemerge into society um, and if you're avoiding versus just taking some time for yourself. Yeah. I would love to add. I needed to, like, hear her speak just so I could get <laughs> my thoughts together, right? Um, I think a really big part of your evolution is also using verbiage that feels less negative and feels more positive, right? So when you said isolation, my, my first thought was like, well, that could be considered a negative thing if you're isolating from people. So I oftentimes take words that have a negative cognition to it and try to put it in a more positive frame. So I would call that spiritual stillness. Um, when I am sitting by myself in a quiet meditative state, I am able to ask myself questions and then get answers. You know, regardless of what you believe in or who you believe in or what supreme being you, you, know, you fall under as far as your worship, it's all the same. When you ask yourself a question in that state and you get an answer, that is when you are you know, curating time for you to listen and for you to ask those deep-rooted questions. So for me, my, my spiritual stillness is such an important part of my day-to-day -day routine that I don't even consider it isolation. I consider it just my time to connect so that I can ask myself really powerful questions that oftentimes nobody else have the answers to. Yep. Awesome. Well, guys, um, if y'all do have further questions with any of our panelists or even myself, please feel free to get with us after. Uh, we are very open to being able to talk to you all. But before um, we go, I want everybody to say, one by one your name and then your Instagram handle or how people can follow you um, or you know put your stuff out there okay get your business again my name is Jakia Brew you can follow me at gully thoughts that's G U L L Y thoughts and the same as my website gullythoughts.com you can find my merch there my online courses there my workbooks there my poetry book there whatever you want hit me up I got books too in my car if you need those <laughs> she got a books in the trunk <laughs> Uh, my name is Akil Bernard on Instagram. It's I am Coach Akil. Akil is spelled A K two E's one L. And I'm in this era now where I'm not hiding behind a specific name. I'm gonna just call it what it is. Akil Bernard is the brand, and I live what I do. And um, if you're looking for somebody to hold space to help you fall back into love with work, advocate for yourself at work, or you need somebody to come pull up a seat and tell your corporate team why mental wellness is important in the workplace. I'm your guy. Happy to help you with that. All right. I'm Elisa Beagle. My IG handle is Beyond Living EB. The website is beyondlivingwellness.com. I'm here to be able to help support anyone navigate through their life, circumstances, or anything that they need. Um, or just, I think another thing I want to really quickly debunk is that you don't have to feel like you have a problem to solve, to go to therapy or have a coach. Sometimes you can just have somebody that you want to just bounce some ideas off of, or you know, you just want to kind of talk through things, you know, and you don't really feel like you can do that with anybody else in your life. So, you know, you don't, yeah, have a non-judgmental lens. Yeah. You don't really okay. have to feel like something is wrong to go to coaching or therapy. So, yeah. My name is Shanti Refuge, and y'all can follow me downstairs. I have a table downstairs. <laughs> and uh, come and see me, come and talk, come and chat. Um, if uh, Otherwise, you can reach me on Instagram, Shanti Refuge Journals, S-H-A-W-N-T-I-R-E-F-U-G-E, -E, Journals. And same is the web address, ShantiRefugeJournals.com. Awesome.
And um, my name is Whitney Ray Hill, and you can follow me on it's Whitney Ray. So I T is Whitney Ray underscore. And if you would love to be one of my clients, um, you can book a chat, um, and you can go to WhitneyRayHill.com. Everything's Whitney Ray Hill. Okay. So that's why when people be like, "Hey, Whitney Ray Hill," it's just Whitney Ray. Okay. <laughs> So um, I really enjoyed y'all today, and I just want to leave y'all with something. You are seen, yes. you are heard, yes. you are loved, and despite all y'all's imperfections, you are perfectly you. Y'all yes. have a great rest of y'all's day.